Let me give you a little uh, injury update. Uh, Gorky's latest uh, exam with the doctor didn't go as well as, a, as my optimism was. Uh, nothing uh, set in the back. Probably the doctor's estimates were, were which are usually very conservative. Now, probably a correct. It would be more than likely four to six weeks rather than the three weeks I hope. I was hoping to get him on the floor for Western, get him a little time and play in the Kentucky game. It doesn't look like that will happen. Um, so he, he is not, he is healing. Uh, the last x-ray we thought it would be healed and it was not. So we, we continue to move. Stephen Van Trees is still not practiced uh, sparingly and we will use him in the game if needed like we did against uh, Memphis. Very, that's basically the, all the injuries. We uh, showed a lot of we showed a great deal of heart and a great deal of uh, desire to win that ball game at Memphis. And I was real proud of that. We did not do a very good job defensively. We have not been as good a defensive team since Gorky has gone down. And you could, you could obviously see the it's not only the the attempts at blocking the shot, but it's it's his size and the altering of shots that go into play much more than the block shot. He's also a very smart defensive player. And I was very disappointed in the, in our mental abilities in, in stopping Memphis. We did not play good defense in the game. We, we did not pay attention to the details of, of our scouting report of what we tried to do against them. But, as usual, shooting cures all your sins. And it always does in basketball, it really does. You can. You can play a very poor game from a strategic standpoint, shoot the ball well, and you look great. And that's what we did in the second half. We, we passed the ball well, we shot the ball well, and it made up for all our def defensive deficiencies. But that's not what can be your common denominator, and that's not what wins in the long, in the long haul. The defense has to be there. And it, it was very much there against Charleston and was very disappointing against Memphis. But we came away with a great road victory, and as, bad a, as tough a crowd as bad, toughest crowd as, as I've seen since I've been at Louisville in terms of their energy in that building. And uh, so it was a great road victory for us. So is the earliest for Gorgi Providence, January 2nd? Or? I would say that that's a realistic goal. Um, the good news is he's in great shape again. We have worked him really, really hard. He is using his left hand. He is obviously using a plastic cast or whatever that is he has on his hand. But we'll be a little conservative with this one. And conservative by my standards, not by probably very liberal by doctor's standards. What about Russ and his ankle the other day? Russ is a faker. <laughs> <laughs> he was playing now if he was playing great, that way he would not have lived off the court. You guys should hmm. buy that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know him really well so you were confident he was coming back? No, not really, because he's. Uh, I was confident uh, that uh, when I saw him on the sidelines, he was definitely coming back. Uh, Fred and I both knew if he was playing great, that wouldn't have been a case. But he's just a very interesting bird, to say the least. Game, but we love him. After the game, he said, he, he kind of told us, he thank you for say, getting on him at halftime. I mean, is that just kind of how he's growing more? Is that another I think so, but he deserved to, to, for everybody to get on. You know, we, we were running plays for Shane, and every play that we put in for Shane, he thought it was, Shane was plan B. It was really for us. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But he really showed great maturity in the second half, made some super passes. Um, got, you know, Russ is, Russ is having a great season. He's just got to... Uh, for some reason, this generation, I mean, there's, there's so much right about this generation, so I hate to pick on it, but they just don't handle success well. They, they, they're great at, at really taking coaching. They're tremendous people, but um, they're just bad at success. Any type of, uh, like when I, Kenny told me Sports Illustrated wants to do a story on Russ, I just cringed. And, um, you know, I wish Kenny would just concentrate on football and the bowl game. He's showing up on the player of the year list. Isn't, why so? Because they don't handle success well. Yeah. You, you know, right now, Shane getting Big East player of the week, that's a disaster week. Because <laughs> <laughs> so they don't work this hard the next week in practice, or what? It's just a generational thing. They, yeah. just, they just think it's, it's either time to party 
or I've arrived, or you know, it, you know, it's just it's just a thing that people, young people, just do not handle success well. You know, it goes back to you know, I was reading a story about Harvard Business School, and they slipped to like number seven after having the best of everything. And why they slip? Because it's a, they thought they were entitled to start in the middle and vice president. You know, and not, not you know, start at the bottom and work your way up like everybody else. That poor, hungry, and driven type attitude. And uh, there was a whole article I was reading about it, and it, it's really true of today. You know, it's it's the best thing to do is have a little adversity always in your life, so you're always on edge, you're always trying to prove yourself, and then you get the best results. And I'm not just talking about Russ or I'm talking about just young people in general, just don't understand that success is just. <laughs> It's just a, a, a glimpse of what today is all about, that you must strive for it every single day and try to be on that journey for success all the time. And it's, it's something that we all, every coach notices. That said, how, how proud are you of the way Richard has, you know, his printing, sorry, I'll volunteer. Good segue. <laughs> <laughs> you know, volunteering when he was in, at Providence at a high school, and now, now he's, he's going to be a head coach on an opposing bench. Well, I think Richard is, is matured the right way. He, nothing's been given to him. Much has been earned. When he was an assistant here, I, I made him work twice as hard as the other assistants and, um, and um, just drove him really, really hard. And he has always been very humble. He's, you know, he's always idolized Billy Donovan growing up. And I just kept telling him, now that he's, though he's grown up and you've grown up, stay after him. That's your blueprint for the type of person you always want to be. And, uh, and there's no better model than, than Billy Donovan in the coaching ranks. I hate to say he's gotten old on me, but he has. I've gotten a lot younger, he's gotten a lot older. So it's, it's uh, something that, you know, the, the Brad Stevens is of the world, the young generation of Shockers, and those people are great for our industry. And, and the Billy Donovan, his age group, is just a, bl a blueprint for the way coaches should act. You've, you've talked to us quite a bit about what, what Billy Minardi meant to you. For, to be playing in the Billy Minardi Classic, to have you on one bench, Richard on the other. What, what would Billy think about that? Well, Billy was very close with Richard and vice versa, and very close to my children. And, um, um, you know, it, it's going to mean a great deal to him, obviously, seeing his uncle's picture around and seeing the, the family. Our family right now is, is uh, more apprehensive and more nervous than Richard and me. I mean, we know what it's all about. We know it's a basketball game, and we know the best team is going to win. Um, and so we, we, we understand what's going to have to be done. Everybody else is on edge a little bit, uh, with the exception of, of, of one son. And everybody else is a totally on edge. Did you thought about any reservations about doing this, about scheduling games with your son? For obvious reasons? Well, I thought it would help him. Us going down there in two years, I thought it would help him. I thought, um, you know, I. Where if he beats us, he he's not only gets a victory, gets a great road win, and gets a very large sum of money which he will not receive. Has to lose. Is he coming back here next year? He is. He is, and we'll go there the third year. And we we obviously did it for Raheem Buckles as well. You know, Rock's going to come back. Hopefully, he'll get two years of play. You know, and that's the way you build this type of program. You take your transfers in, you recruit well. And he's got a great group of guys. They're a very good offensive basketball team. They're working on their defense. Now, you know, that's the last game that I've watched with him, I said, you know, we just got to get better defensively. And he said he has in the last week. He, but he's got a very good offensive ball club, and he's got some good players. You know, Florida Gulf Coast game, you know, they beat Miami, and Miami's very good. It was a road game, and with 10 seconds to go, he could have won the game game was his to win on the road. So they are improving, going the right way, and just hope they haven't improved too much. What's, have you thought about what it's going to be like looking down? I mean, you knew this day was going to come probably at some point. I'm just real proud of him. Um, but, you know, he's been taught when the ball goes up, you you got to beat Lowell. And when the ball goes up, we got to beat FIU. We won't be looking down at each other at all when the game goes on. We'll be focused in on, on concentrating on on beating each other, and then we're going to have a party afterwards in Billy Minotti's honor, and um, and that's it. it. It's over, and the game's over, and we'll talk about the game and how we should get better, what he thinks of us, what we think of, of him. Uh, the players know it's, uh, you know, Richard texts a lot of his players. I, I'll, I text Richard's players, so, uh, you know, they're all very close. Rick, do they use a lot of the same terminology and sets and, and that that you do? 
No, I would say his offense is more like Billy's offense, uh, and his defense is more like ours. After you, Stephen Mass, he said that he had tried to call you and you weren't going to, you had returned his call. Same with Richard. So when's the last time you talked to I speak Richard? to Richard two, three times a day. We text ten times a day. Even going into this game? Yeah. What's mom you played about the Stetson game. I mean, it, do you watch his other games live on the computer? Or? If I can, I do, but I watch it. Um, I watch it after the game, uh, and I break it down, and I make my notes, and then I, I speak to him the next morning and say, this is what I, what I think. And so you can watch it live? I mean, is it hard for you to, to watch it I, I was, you know, Ralph Willett always said this to me. He said, you know, you're not, you don't understand, because he always, I said, will you stop getting so bent out of shape with Kevin Willett's games? And he said, you just wait when Richard becomes a head coach. I've coached a long time, a lot of pro and college games, and I was sick the entire Stetson game. <laughs> I was sick to my stomach. I was really having heart palpitations. I was having my blood pressure was way up. I'm yelling at his players. Uh, and I said, I got to get out of here. I got to go I got a glass of wine and get settled down and stuff. And, uh, it was just so, and, and I could just imagine what, you know, tomorrow night's going to be like, you know, it's, uh, in this situation. But it's, 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 you want him to win so badly. He's got a great group of kids, of young men, and they're working real hard for him. And, you know, I know his whole staff real well. So it's, it is very difficult. You can just imagine, you know, you all have children, what it's like and how hard you root for your kids. And, but, I'm, you know, it's, it was a quiet place, Stetson, and, and I'm telling some of his players to dig in defensively, and I'm on the edge of my seat. Uh, it, it was a bad feeling. Where's mom at with all this? I'm sorry? Where's mom at with all this? She's crazy. She's crazy. <laughs> she don't understand it's a basketball game. She's taking it way too personal. And, and um, you know, it's... I'm actually putting her in different seats. She wants to sit in the, I told her to sit behind Richard's bench. I don't want her on my side. <laughs> so she's we're sitting right in the middle of seats that she's never sat in. So she's, that's going to change and make the game a close game in her mind. How many of your children will be here? They're all going to be here. Everybody but Ryan, he's got to, he can't get off. He's got to, he's one of those poor hungry and driven people that have to work all the time. <laughs> Are there any parallels, I know you were younger, but are there any parallels in Richard's first year and his situation and yours? At I took over a very good, talented basketball team at Boston University. They lost, and they hadn't had a winning year in a long time, maybe 15, 20 years, whatever it was. But I was 24, and I think the average age of my team was like 21, 22. I had a 23-year-old. I mean, it was, it was strange. They were very mature and very old for a basketball team, so I was left with talent. Richard has eight new players, all the guys left, and he was left with an academic mess uh, like, like none you've seen. So he, he, he not only has to turn around the culture of work on the basketball court with all new players, he doesn't have Isaiah's players, and, but he's got to turn around the culture academically. He's got to turn around, he's got to beat the drums for fans. He's got, you know, he's got, you got, when you're at that level, it's fun because you've got to do it all. You got to do it all, but you you know you got, can't be afraid to sweep the floors. You can't be afraid to to do all the little things that make it fun, and that's the way you learn this business. You learn it from the bottom up. You know, you know, you know like I was talking about the Harvard graduate. You know, you start at the bottom when you take over at FIU. In, in every phase of the game, you've got to take your road games and get your guarantees to run your program. You've got to run fundraising events. You've got to get around and speak to the students. You've got to, and uh, you better be bilingual. Because he's got you know fifty thousand students, and I bet you know, twenty thousand speak Spanish. Was he just ready to be a head coach? I mean, was there was it another year as an assistant? You know, it's funny. Much for him? We had a conversation. It was a weird conversation. We were riding one day. He picked me up, and it was in his first year. And he said, "You know, I'm not like you." And I said, "Thank God." And he said, <laughs> "He said, uh, you know, I'm just not in a rush to be a head coach. I could stay at Louisville until I'm." 32, 33, 34 years old. I'm just not in a rush like you were. And I said, that's great. I said, it's a great town, great for a family and everything else. And then all of a sudden, about midway through the year, and he was doing all the scouts, and he just, he started looking at, I heard him speaking with some of the other coaches about jobs opening up. I said, what happened that you, that you just going to be patient and wait? He said, I don't know. I just think I'm ready. <laughs> and I, it just in three months, he went from very comfortable to and, you know, his, he's obviously very close with his mom. Um, 
not that he's not close with me, he's very close with me, but he's very close with his mom. And he knew the thing he was concerned most about he was if he moved, he would break her heart, you know, because she, uh, she, she got more excited about seeing him on the bench than me on the bench because I'm all hat over the hill. He's not. So it's, uh, you know, all of a sudden he just wanted to be a head coach. And I didn't understand where this came from. And only uh, it, it triggers in everybody at, at that moment. And he wanted to be a head coach. Could some so, of that could some question him doing all the scouts and you know he becomes more sure of himself because he's got more responsibility and things of that nature. I think he had a very large part uh, in us going to a Final Four and winning a Big East championship. He was very, very much in on the strategy, and um, he was a big part of, of everything we did and accomplished last year. The players do all the work. The coaches develop the strategy. The players got to then take the strategy and, and they got to make it happen. But Richard was a big part of our success last year, and uh, and he, and he he felt very good about himself and what we accomplished, and he should have. And his team right now will, you know, it, it'll be a it'll be interesting because he knows that I know them very well. He knows I follow their every move. Only he thinks that he knows us even better because he recruited some of the players. He went through all the guys and. Uh, so that's why we have ch we have changed an awful lot to get ready for this game. We put in things that he hasn't seen before. You mentioned when the game was first announced that you were looking forward to, to giving him a spank in his first <laughs> spank. I was joking back then. <laughs> joking back then. Um, no, I want to I want to see him his team play well. But I, I really am concerned about our basketball team right now. I, I just did not like the way we played against Memphis at all. I thought we, we just did not pay attention. You know, we want to do three things in that game. We want to stop their transition by taking good shots and getting back, get, getting what we call three and a half players back. Um, and then we wanted to make sure that we handle the basketball and by taking high percentage shots, make them guard and get to the foul line, which we did do in the second half. And the third thing we want to do is get on the backboard and pay attention to them. A guy like Shane, who played very well, had three rebounds in the game. And we didn't rebound the ball. You know. So, you know, again, we shot and passed the ball well. We had a great road victory. We took on a, a hostile crowd, but we did not get better in that basketball game. We did not get better at the defensive end. And that's really troubling that we did not improve it, it defensively. So we, 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 we move on and we, we want to get better. We're, we're going to face, I mean, this is an emotional game. It's the Billy Minotti Classic. It's my son and everything else. But we want to get better because we have to go on the road and play. Um, in national playing against Weston, who, who took Murray State to the wire, life and death at Murray, which is a very difficult place to play. And then we got to come home and play Kentucky. So we want to make improvements, and we did not make improvements. And now we did offensively in the Memphis game because we, we made free throws, we made shots, we handled the ball well <coughs> under pressure. We did a lot of really, really good things that help you win a game, but we did not get better at defense. And that's very disturbing for me as a basketball coach going into this to go getting ready for the Big East schedule. What are the family logistics of these next couple of days? Is Richard going to be there with the rest of your family, or will he be at the team hotel? And if he's at home with you, just how funny is that to have an opposing coach? Like I said, with us, the two of us, we'll go out to dinner tonight. Yeah. Um, my oldest son, my middle son, my, my wife, Richard, me, are all going out. The girl's going out to some party, and um, he'll be with me the entire time. And he'll be my son at dinner. He'll be my son, and and uh, won't be coach versus coach. And then the only time that'll happen is those two hours that we face that game. And so it's it's we're we're great. Look, we we uh, we'll we'll joke around with each other a little bit, and he'll tell me what he's going to play. He'll lie to me. I'll lie to him. <laughs> uh, but we know that we're smart enough to know that the players win games, not coaches. And uh, so. It'll be FIU versus us tomorrow, but we'll have a great time with it. It's we are honoring the Billy, Min, uh, Billy Minotti's memory with this, the celebration of his life and this game and his family, and, and we'll all be after the game. We'll have one big celebration. One of the guys you got started with, Jim Beheim, won his 900th last night. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I was there for his first win. I believe it was Harvard, and I had so many funny memories with Jim uh, from the from when we played Magic Johnson and to in the Carrier Classic to his first two years of going out and recruiting. We had so many great times. And it doesn't really, he's one of the few guys that this doesn't, it's milestone doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me that he's been there that long. 
It doesn't surprise me that he has 900 victories. It doesn't surprise me that he's had that great success all the way through because he's a great recruiter. He's a great X and O guy. And he doesn't complicate the game. He makes the game not only fun for his players, he makes the game easy for his players because he doesn't try to complicate the game. He, he, he plays the zone, which every year everybody shoots a low percentage. Uh, he, he recruits the length that makes the zone successful. At the offensive end, his, his players get out there and run on the break all the time. They, they're unselfish, they pass, they always have a high number of assists. So he's one of the guys that understands his system, recruits to his system, and uh, really does a magnificent job. Quite a, quite a, a feat. <clears throat> about Angels transferring before we went into that? Hey, we, I've known him for some time. Uh, you know, it's, and, and I'm, I'm for guys playing that after their sophomore year, if they're not playing, um, and if we don't, we don't see the potential for getting major minutes, they should transfer. But here's the key. I've had, I've said it many times, six or seven transfers that have, uh, that have done extremely well. The guys who leave, if they pick the like Lorenzo Wade did a great job of picking San Diego State and had a nice career there. It's all the key that you, like I was very much for Lorenzo at, at, at San Diego State. It's all the key of where you pick. If, if you if you're not smart about it, and then, you, then you're wasting your time. I mean, if you don't go to a place that it needs your talents, where if he wants to play 30 minutes a game, go 30. He's got to pick the right place to play 30 minutes a game. And there are some schools that we release them to. They're very smart. There are other schools that make no sense at all because they're in the Big East, and it's it's against the bylaws. You can't, as long as the Big East is breathing, you can't go to a Big East school um, until they're they're out in another conference. So you got to do your homework a little bit, research a little bit more, but I want the best for him. A nice young man, really loves the game of basketball, but he's behind um, Wayne and Luke, and I don't see any playing time from down the road. So it's a good transfer, and uh, hope he picks the right school that fits his skills. Anything else? Thank you. Thanks, guys.